Good morning, everybody. I hope you started your day off on the right foot. And if you're feeling iffy about today, then today's stories are going to leave you feeling inspired. Our guests today faced the impossible and not only survived, but came out stronger. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Their journeys, their stories, and how they ended up to where they are today and what that took. Uh, my first guest is Jillian Mutinda, who not only survived cancer, but also went through alcoholism and a period of depression, but came out as a motivational speaker, given what she experienced. So welcome, Jillian. Thank you. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling a bit hot. A, <laughs> a bit hot. <laughs> yeah. It is really hot. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, positive that my story will come out and uh, people will get to learn something from it. Right, and I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. So let's start with your childhood. Can you tell me about your your health growing up and whether you noticed that you know you were getting sick more than other kids or something was off or how were you as a child we're a family of eight kids and one boy so we're eight girls and one boy but i grew up with a lot of health issues um like i remember in school i wasn't able to do like during parade i wouldn't stand because standing for long i'd start seeing uh, bluish and feel dizzy. Wow. And this is, uh, how old are you? Very young. Okay. Perhaps uh, seven, eight. Seven, eight. And yeah. did you ever voice that to anyone? Yeah. Okay. So I was taken to a doctor, yeah. but I mean, they said nothing. Then I remember I had issues with my ears. Mm. Like it was just one thing after the other okay. as I was growing up. Yeah. But now it got worse when I went into high school. Oh, how so? So when I went into in high school, I got I, I was diagnosed with anemia. Okay. So they didn't know why I had the anemia, but they, they at least they started treating it because before they found out it was anemia, I was like fainting a lot. I was, you know, it was just difficult in school. Yeah. 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 So once they found out, then I was put in on medication, and that was I think my last year in, in high school. High school. Yeah. Okay. Right, but then you leave high school or towards the end you start to have a, a pain in your yeah. arm, right? So after high school, okay. um, I finished high school, uh, I remember the results were already out. Mm. Your then school I, results, you mean? Yes. Okay. So then I started having uh, pain, right? But it was just normal pain, so I figured, you know, maybe I just slept on my arm or something like that. But then my mom decided, you know what, just go check it, mm. get it checked out. How long had you been having the pains? A few months. So, a few, oh, so it was a few months. Yeah. And where was it exactly? On the proximal humerus, which is the shoulder. Yeah. Okay. So you then your mom then says maybe yeah. we should check it out because it's obviously been going on for a while. Yeah. Okay. So I went in and saw a doctor who said I have mild arthritis. Okay. Then of course give me some medicines. Yeah. A month later, nothing was changing. I went to another doctor who said a sprain. I don't even know how a sprain happens in, yeah, in the, on part. the shoulder yeah. area, but yeah, nothing happened weeks. Yeah. Uh, it was just getting worse. So actually what, what I had noticed was the pain was much worse at night. During the day I was fine, like I could do things okay. normally, yeah. but at night I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do yeah. anything. The pain was just too intense. Yeah, And you're still taking medication for arthritis? So I stopped the arthritis okay. when this other one said it's a sprain. Yeah, so you're so taking you medication. Pain meds okay, and, yeah. for the sprain. Then um, after that, now I remember my mom had travelled to go see my my sisters in Australia. Mm -hmm. So when she came back, I remember um, telling uh, she she was like, "Your hand has been having issues for months now mm. because this is now from." Uh, 2007 all through now to 2008 Eight. yeah so and now it's around June okay July so my sister said okay I know an orthopedic surgeon at Aga Khan you need to go and uh, see this doctor and find out what's wrong mm -hmm. so when I went to Aga Khan I forgot the name of the, the doctor that I was sent to okay but I just knew okay it's an orthopedic surgeon yeah. so I just kind of just chose one of them and went in to see them yeah so i remember when i walked in that the doctor looked at me and he asked me how did you get here yeah i told him i came by myself like he asked you're not with your mom or I was like, yeah. no i'm 18 i mean yeah. 
I'm old enough. Right. Then uh, he just uh, started looking at my eyes and... Um, but what made him ask you that? Because I was pale. So just so from, he could, from the moment you walked in, you hadn't even said anything about your pain, just looked, he looked at, at you my eyes and, and says... Anemia was getting worse because okay. of what uh, cancer is, is this, the cancer cells are doing yeah. in my body. So he, re he recognized that from... Just the, by looking at you? Yeah. Okay. Then he asked me a few questions. Then he's like, um, go do this test. I've written them under emergency, but tomorrow you have to come with your mom. So I said, okay. And he hasn't said anything about what he suspects? No, he just said that and then I left. Okay. So I went home, I told my mom, okay, so these are the tests that I'm supposed to do. Yeah. After we do this test, uh, the doctor needs to see us. So I remember the next day uh, we go to hospital so we did all the tests, but I remember like I was in such pain, like because mm. um, like when I was doing the X-ray, this is how they have to lift your hand. Yeah. And at that point, it was already difficult um, moving, moving my left, yeah, yeah, my left arm. So after the tests, then my mom went in now. So I was told to wait at the waiting area. Yeah. And my mom went in, like she was there for hours. Yeah. While I was in the waiting area, I was like, oh, maybe I have cancer. This was actually a joke yeah. because like, probably, yeah, a joke because I remember the movies during those yeah. years, yeah. no one, you, you wouldn't see anyone surviving cancer. Right. Like everyone right. was dying from yeah. cancer. And so that's all the information that you had. That so I for had. you, cancer equaled Death. Equals death. Yeah, okay. that's all I knew. I yeah. was pretty naive at that point. Yeah. I had never thought about it, to be yeah. honest. After a few hours, my mom comes out and yeah. she tells me, um, you need to call your dad and uh, your elder sister. They need to come to hospital. And so I'm thinking, okay, yeah. why can't I come in? She's like, we, I need to finish first with the doctor. Okay. So my dad and my... Um, my sister, sister. Yeah. they come, they go in. I'm still not allowed to go in. Yeah. So they have a conversation. And then eventually at like 6 p.m. is when I was going in. Okay. So I've spent the whole day. Out in the waiting area. Yeah. So when I went in, the doctor asked me, so do you know what a tumor is? I was like, uh, yeah. So I asked him, is it like a growth or? Yeah. He's like, yeah, but I'm not so sure. So we want to admit you tomorrow for a biopsy. So they wanted to do a biopsy on this area to find out if it's really cancer or it's something else. Yeah, yeah. So then we said fine, wow. that was okay. So I, I've got to ask you, when he's now explaining this to you, tumor, you need to do a biopsy, what was going through your mind? I honestly don't remember much on that day because I remember I had sat for so long, and so I was in so much pain. Yeah. Um, he even gave me like a painkiller, I remember. Yeah. And I didn't really, at that, on that particular day, yeah. I really didn't think about it. Yeah. Like okay. he said, okay. you know, a tumor, it might yeah. or it might not be. Right. So, okay. you know. So then you come back the next day. So I didn't get to the next day. Oh. So what happened is, um, of course, we went home. Yeah. And uh, at night, I was just in immense pain, okay. like crazy pain. Yeah. I was rushed to hospital, so they immediately just admitted me. They started uh, giving uh, blood and uh, drips and all this. Wow. Then I don't have much recollection of that night. Yeah. So I remember now the next day at 3 p.m. is when now I was being taken for the biopsy. Right, right. So then it comes out that you do have cancer. So now after the biopsy, yeah. because it's the bone, yeah. so it takes a bit a few of... Days, like yeah. about so a week took, or so. It took, it took actually 11 days. Yeah for them to find out if it's really cancer or what the problem is. Yeah. But like I could tell within five days they knew what was going right. on but they're not telling, telling me. You. And it's like they're scared of right. how I'll yeah. react. Right. So and what, what was the kind of cancer that they so, so I had osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer of yeah. a proximal humerus, stage yeah. three. Wow. And how old are you at this point? I had just turned twenty. You just turned twenty. Yeah. You've just been told that you've got stage three cancer. 
Yeah. And what are you thinking? At this point, everyone is, everyone was actually crying around me. Yeah. Other than my mom, I, during this whole time, I yeah. never saw my mother cry, wow. not even once. Yeah. But I remember uh, the doctor saying, uh, so we have to amputate because there's nothing we can do for you here. Like, and at that point, cancer was really like a big, big, big issue in mm. Kenya. Mm. And so we had a doctor who was a family friend who was also my hematologist. Mm. So he came to us and then he said, uh, listen, you can find treatment for this cancer elsewhere, like in okay. um, India, Egypt, yeah. uh, USA, South Africa. He right. gave us options. Yeah. Um, so his recommendation was I do at least two chemotherapy, two cycles of chemotherapy before considering amputation or you know something no, before, that drastic so amputation was now off the table yeah okay. after he told us okay that there's get, options uh, treatment elsewhere okay so immediately my family just started looking at those options yeah and what that what was that process like because i know it, it wasn't an overnight thing and i know you ended up having to go i actually uh, do not because i was really sick so they actually used to come to hospital like all my things in terms of the visa process right. and everything yeah was done from hospital but you needed to go to India at some point right yes yeah so uh, what that whole process of trying to fight the cancer what where did you draw your strength from I'd say the first person actually I drew my strength from was my mom mm. because like, I used to look at her and she had this Positivity, like she was, you know, you're going to be fine. Like um, this is not the end. This is right. not. But everyone else around me was, you know, um, pitying me and like wondering what if she dies. And mm. you, you know, you can see it from their actions, yeah. from how they even look at you, you know. And um, personally, I was in a really bad space because I was thinking, okay. Here I am, I was supposed to join university. Actually, right. I, was, I was going to do law at uh, Curtin University. Yeah, in Australia. Yes. Yeah. And uh, now your plans have changed. Now that has yeah. changed. Then, I'm th of course, at that point you're thinking, I'm going to be so old by the time I go to university and, mm. and you know, such like things. But it's interesting and to note though, that you were thinking, I'll make it out of this. I'm just concerned about how long it's going to take me to Very, make it actually, out. Actually, and I, the, the funny thing is that I did not realize that I was actually being that positive. Yeah. Like I was being, but I did not realize until a bit much yeah. uh, later. Yeah. And so I remember um, I come from a Catholic family. Okay. And so I remember I, I would pray and tell God, you know what? let your will be done. Mm. Wh whatever happens, happens. Mm. But I was also at a very, um, like I was in this void mm. that I could not come out of as much as I wanted to come out of it, mm. right? And uh, then I started, they, they, they said, we need to do two cycles of chemotherapy. And at this point, I don't know what chemotherapy is, so this is when I started doing research. Okay. Like, you to know, try and deep, understand, deep, deep research. Dig deep. I found out what is cancer, what is this osteosarcoma, yeah. why do I have it? I've never gotten that answer till right, today, right? right. And um, who, who does it affect mostly and, you know, things like that. Mm. What is chemotherapy? What actually happens during this time? Right. And so I started chemotherapy and it was awful. Yeah. Like, that was my first... Um, worst experience mm. because it was being done intravenously but it shouldn't be painful mm. right which means the cannula had been placed wrongly number one uh. so I was in so much pain then you know like my strength just completely right yeah and I know you even ended up losing a lot of weight during this period yes. right you went from being no so now this is after I came back from India from again. India so that's like yeah. a, a different uh, phase okay all together so this time um, you know nausea um, I can't even walk around right. I can't do anything basically you're being helped to do everything wow. yeah and you're used to 
doing things on your, on own. your own. It must have been like really tough for you to swallow. Yeah. Again, I can't, you know, your life, your dreams, what your vision had for your vision for yourself was having to shift that entirely. Yeah. Um, must have been must have been such a challenge. Yeah. Um, and not even knowing what will happen. Right. Like I, ca I can't even not knowing imagine. Will I wake up tomorrow? Yeah. You know, it's, Ooh, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's crazy yeah. like, having to think about those things. Right. Sorry, we've got to take a break. We've got to take a break, but we'll be right back um, with more from Gillian. And we're going we're gonna to learn more about uh, how she was able to fight it, how she struggled with yet another battle, um, but how she made it out, out of it at the end of the day. We're at Park Inn by Radisson. We'll be back in a moment. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. We're at Park Inn by Radisson, and we've been listening to Gillian's story, who at 20 years old was diagnosed with cancer and then began the journey of, of rehabilitation and coming out of that, which we were getting into before the break, you know, and you said you had to go to India, you'd lost weight, you went from, you know, 60 kilos to 24 kgs. Um, can you can you tell me about the moment where you learned that you were cancer free? So when we went to India, I was going to do three cycles for three months, mm. and each cycle was about a week long. long. And then after that, they were going to do a PET scan, mm -hmm. which usually will just mark where the cancer is. Mm -hmm. But they had already told us that radiotherapy was not an option in my case. Mm. So it was just chemotherapy and surgery. And so I remember after the three cycles, doctors were actually amazed because mm. I was getting a really high dose of chemotherapy during that time. Mm -hmm. And most people had not survived from it. Like, like I'm sure you've heard of most people with cancer, sometimes even the cancer does not kill you. It's mm. the chemotherapy because of it's very toxic. Mm. And so if it's not being flushed out well, then it's damaging your organs. Mm. And then when they did the PET scan, their hope was that after this, the, the cycles of, of the chemotherapy, that the cancer cells would lodge in one area, mm. then it would actually be easier for them to do the surgery. So, by some miracle, yeah. that happened. Wow. So they all lodged on the proximal humerus. Okay. So then he said, okay, so in a week's time we can do your surgery. So the surgery was, they were going to cut out the bone, mm -hmm. the proximal humerus, and replace it with a prosthesis. Okay. So that's what they did. Yeah. It was, um, I was in surgery from 8 a.m. to about 4 p.m. Right. And then uh, after surgery, of course, it was my first major surgery and I was in so much pain. I remember, of course, you're hallucinating mm. and all these kinds of things, but my mom was there. Mm. So two weeks later, I was good. Wow. They did, uh, so they had to do a, a post-op yeah. uh, PET scan yeah. and some blood tests. Yeah. Then they said, so you're 99% um, free of cancer, so you're in remission. And what, 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 is your, what are you thinking? So I was like, oh my God, like this is actually happening. Yeah. Like this is actually over. But it was not over really because right. after that then he said, but you have to do chemotherapy for another year. So the reason that happens to do post chemotherapy is so that in case Right. It uh, recurs because yeah. that happens a lot. Okay. So then wow. I was tired of yeah. staying in India. Mm. And so I asked my mom, can we just do this back home? Yeah. Like, so that I want to go back to school right. and do all this And get back to your life. Because at this point, how old were you? I'm still 20. You're still 20. In the, it's still all this happened in, yeah. in that. So this is now 2008. <gasps> Yeah. That is a lot to go through in just one year. Okay. So yeah. then you want to come back to Kenya. You want to go back to school. Yeah. And you and do eventually. right now also my career path has changed completely. completely. Like I'm thinking I'm not going to do five years in university. Yeah. 
And so I had already made up my mind, I'm going to do a business degree, probably marketing. Right. So you and do then, you then come back and you do start So I come start back school. and what, no. Okay. So when I came back, uh, what the doctors did, they did a schedule for um, the oncologist I was going to use here in Kenya. Yeah. And they said that's what she should use in terms of the medicines I should be getting for chemotherapy and yeah. all this. Yeah. So in October, I started the first cycle and it was just bad. Just to go back a bit, when I was in India, yeah. I never lost my hair. Yeah. My hair was growing back, even I was, I was doing chemotherapy. chemotherapy. I was never fatigued, I yeah. was never nauseated, like yeah. I was just fine. So here I am now, my hair is falling, falling off. Uh, off again. Yeah. I'm dizzy all the time, I'm fatigued, I can't do anything for myself. Right. So that's the first month. Then November, I do the second cycle, and things just get crazy. Right. Worse. So yeah. I start having um, sores in my mouth. Wow. And then December, I do another one. And at this point, even talking was a problem because what had happened, I had the sores. They had gone through all the way into my throat. Oh, and, my um, goodness. The stomach. Yeah. So I'm not able to eat. Basically, right. it's fluids. And even with the fluids, it's... It's Give. still not, yeah, it's still give and take. Yeah. So I know at this point then you realize you had to go back to India because you were on, so the no, doctor was Actually, wasn't. at this point is where now I've lost, when I came back from India, I was 60 kilos. So now it's December and I'm 24 mm. kilos. Then uh, 1st of January, people woke up, like my family woke up, they went to church. I don't remember much because what happened is I collapsed because I was in the house alone. Mm. So they just came and found me on the floor and I was rushed to hospital. So when I was rushed to hospital, I was just like in so many drips and they yeah. had to feed me with the drips because I couldn't talk, yeah. I couldn't do anything at that point. So that's when now we decided, okay, you know what? We're going back to India, uh, India because this is not working out. Yeah. And I had, that, that was my lowest moment, mm. so to speak, because I sort of felt that it was easier to, or it was a, a much better option to die yeah. than to live with such pain because it was just immense pain, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I always tell people that the pain that I, I have gone through is not pain I would wish even on my... Worst enemy. Yes. Okay, and at this point I imagine your mother was still your, your, your rock, your source yes. of strength. So she was used to travel with me everywhere. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, I'm curious to know where else you sourced your, uh, you know, the sense of hope or uh, so strength from. The one thing that I realized growing up, yeah. I was also the one person in the family who sort of brings people together. together. If there's a conflict, I'd be there. Mm. And, you know, and that's how people knew that she mm. was going to be a lawyer. Mm. So I was usually very strong, very um, strong-willed, mm. uh, you know? And so I think uh, when I got sick, it sort of just um, made sense to continue. And when I look back, actually, I keep on saying, I don't see anyone else in my family who could have gone through, gone it. through yeah. it. And so there's a reason why it, it had to, to be, be you. me. That's yeah. so interesting. So I want us to, to dive into when you went to school and some of the, you know, the new battle that you had to face with regards to yeah. addiction. So after cancer, once you're a survivor, mm -hmm. all everyone sees is, oh, you're so lucky. Oh, you need to be more appreciative. Right. Oh, you know, this is the a blessing. Chance, yeah, should, this yeah. is your second chance at life. But people also forget that you have dealt with a very traumatic experience. Yeah. And then it means then you need to deal with it. Right. Which I didn't, mm. you know? Like, um, I would make appointments with counselors, psychiatrists. Then I would just be like, you know what? These people are not going to help me. Mm. And so I just delved into alcohol. Mm. It, it seemed to make me forget because the one thing that was really disturbing me at the time was why did I get the cancer? Why mm. not anyone else? That was one of the questions I asked a lot. And the second question I asked myself frequently was what if it comes back again? Because then you've been told then there's a chance of it recurring. And this just makes right. you want to feel numb. Yeah. 
and not so I just started drinking and you know it and did you, did you tell anyone that that you were thinking these things did you no. find refuge so in, uh, in I, I, I sort of dealt with these things by myself so I would just drink and you know when I'm not drinking it's class and uh, you know drinking class drinking class okay. and partying yeah that so, kind of thing so at which point did it become apparent that it there was an issue that uh, that this needed to be so stopped. I had drunk for six years mm. and it had become progressive drinking as you know that's that's what happens with alcoholism yeah and um, in 2016, it was just really bad. Mm. I had already graduated from university in 2013, working and all these things. So in 2016, it was really bad. Like every other weekend I was in hospital because, you know, I've drunk too much. Wow. And so it's my mom who has to bear this. Uh, she takes me to hospital almost every weekend. And so of course she started, you know what? You need to go to rehab. And at this point I'm still in denial because I said, um, okay, why can't I do an outpatient program? I don't think I want to go for an inpatient mm. program, which is usually like three months or however. So she said, okay, let's look for some. And at this point, you know, I'm, I'm in denial things. And I've broken so many family ties, mm. you know, with my, fam my sisters and we're not even talking because, you know, you're screwing up so much as, as you're drinking and, right. and you're trying to deal with all these things. Yeah. And so in August, um, my eldest sister, she came to the country. At the time, she was living in Ghana. Mm. So she came and uh, they actually tricked me into going to rehab. Mm. So I went to rehab and the first few days, I was like, I don't think I can stop drinking. Like, I mean, I'll stay here for three months and then go out and, I mean, it's not possible mm. for me to not drink because I had tried so many times, yeah. you know? And it's not just something you wake up and say, okay, now I've stopped. Mm. It was very difficult and every time I'd try and stop because I was a binge drinker. Mm. So I'd drink um, on week, like from Thursday to all through to Sunday, mm. you know? And so, binge drinkers are actually the worst kind because what happens is let's there's some people who even don't drink for a year yeah but then when you go back you sort of want to compensate for a year yeah and that's why you're the worst kind of okay. a drinker if you're a binge drinker you're you're much worse than someone who does it every day okay. and so three days into rehab um i saw this lady come in mm. So most people uh, who would be brought to rehab would be brought when they were really high or, you know, so that they could accept. Mm. Myself, I was sober when I was taken to rehab and that was a good thing because mm. now I got to see people coming in. And so this lady is the one that changed my mindset because what happened is when she came, like she was having these withdrawal symptoms yeah. that were really bad. Yeah she was shaking she couldn't even like hold a spoon or anything yeah and i remember the next day she was told uh don't because the rehab i went to was uh at kent Mia, so it's very hilly mm. and she was told don't walk around because you might get um uh, seizures because mm. that also happens mm. with withdrawal but she did not listen and what happened is she went and then she fell and her skull kind of Cracked open. Yes. Wow. And I remember like, you know, addicts are very funny people because people ran away. Yeah. But I was kind of like going towards it. Yeah. And, like sort of to help and yeah. see what's happening. And I remember talking to the manager at the, at the, the, the head counselor there yeah. and t asking him, you want to tell me that this is alcohol? Like alcohol yeah. does this? And I told him, this is it. Like I've made up my mind that I know for sure I'll never drink again. Wow. And so for that, what I decided to do is follow the program. You know, we okay. have um, all these right. rules. Right, so now you are committed to it. Yes. So how long have you been sober now, Gillian? Two years, six months. Two years, six months. Yes. What would you want to say to anyone who's watching and going through something that seems impossible, whether it is a diagnosis 
or an addiction? What, what message would you have for them? The one thing that I've learned is never lose hope. That's, that's my one, the, my number one motto is never lose hope. Mm. Because with hope then everything sort of lines up together then right. you have you get this immense strength mm. and you just start uh, being positive and you know during this time it's also usually very nice to avoid negativity mm -hmm. because you'll find people who are just there pitying you or you know mm. thinking waiting for you to die and mm. it's just amazing when you're positive about it how it actually um, impacts your life. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and an example I can give is, I'm usually under a lot of uh, medication, but let's say I get a headache, I will not take. Mm. Because you need uh, to ask yourself, like right now, the weather probably, you're dehydrated, mm. but you've rushed to medicine. Right. Whereas you could have just drunk water and yeah. it goes, um, it goes away. So like mind over matter kind right. of thing. Yeah. So dealing with big issues and just having that hope and, and, and trying to f fulfill your purpose. Yeah. And I think once you get there, like even though you succumb to it mm. and God forbid maybe you die from that illness, mm. you will have done your very your best. Yeah. And I love that. And I think that that's something that anyone watching um, can take on with them as they go through their day, whatever it is. It's so beautiful that you had that even when you didn't know you had that. You know, like earlier when you were saying how what you were focused on is, ugh, now I'm gonna take longer to finish school. Yeah. But whether you knew it or not, subliminally, you were already telling yourself like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna survive this. Yeah. I just need to figure out how I'm gonna go about school. Yeah. Um, and I love that, I love that message. Thank you so much, Jillian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thank you for sharing your story and, and sharing it not just with us, but you know, with the, with the motivational speaking that you're doing. I know you're impacting so many people's lives. Yes. So bless you. Thank bless you so much. much. All right, we've got to take a break, but we'll be right back with another incredible story. So do not go anywhere.